Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this webisode, we're going to talk to a leader in arbitration who has been a leader for many years. We have Edna Sussman. So not only is she the distinguished ADR practitioner in residence at Fordham University, but she has been named the 2020 Neutral of the Year Award by the National Association of Distinguished um, neutrals. She has been on the AAA, or she is currently on the American Arbitration Association board. She has also been the past president of the College of Commercial Arbitrators and has arbitrated over, I'm, I'm sure that it's over 200, 300 cases, I believe, um, maybe even more. So very thankful for you to be here with us, Edna. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Really delighted to be here and glad to reconnect with you after all these years. I know it's been forever. And, and I love the topic um, that we were talking about, sort of thinking about proactive arbitrators and what does that mean, right? You know, there's a lot of different ideas we can have in our head about what is a pro -ar proactive arbitrator and why that might be beneficial. So I'm going to start with kind of asking you, in your view as an arbitrator with a ton of experience, what does it mean to be a proactive arbitrator? You know, I think when we first started talking about the subject, we called it managerial or proactive. We were very much focused on time and cost and efficiency. And that's still obviously a very important piece. I think as the years have gone on and now with the passage of the uh, Singapore Convention that makes mediated settlement agreements enforceable across borders. And now we've got, <laughs> we've got the new convention on you know, the enforcement of foreign judgments it's gonna to begin to change the field because there will be all these other vehicles that are enforceable across borders. And we used to kind of have a lock on that with arbitration. So I think beyond thinking about costs and efficiency uh, in terms of the role of the arbitrator as a more proactive and managerial, it's also, you know, what is it that you do or can do that may actually help the parties get to settlement without leaving your role as an arbitrator, you know, not becoming necessarily the mediator in the traditional role. Uh, but, you know, are there things you can do? Is more communication going to be helpful? Why, why do cases settle so much more in court in the U.S. than in arbitration, for example? Right. And I think you know, part of that has got to be that people see each other so much more often in a court proceeding than they do in arbitration. It's just a lot more contact. So, it just got me thinking about what is it that we do and, and how do some of the things that we do now, uh, how can they influence people? You know, so I've yeah. done the stuff on the psych side also, you know, sort of the psychological influences that, that inhibit people from settling. Are there things we do that actually play into that and actually could have a role from that perspective as well? Oh, yeah. No, that's a really great point, especially talking about sort of you know, running into people in the halls and what that means and how does that inspire kind of settlement? You know, when we think about sort of as your role as an arbitrator, what are some examples? Maybe you can give an example of what it means of being a proactive arbitrator or thinking in those terms. Yeah, you know, um, well, let me take a very simple example, which is the first case management conference, the first preliminary hearing. And those of us that grew up at the AAA have, have always done it. We've always had a preliminary hearing. And actually, my checklist is the one that pretty much ended up in the rules now for the procedural, you know, for what you should be doing. But, you know, that wasn't necessarily true in all of the institutions. And I still run into, you know, very well-known arbitrators who are chairing. And it, the first case conference is just totally pro forma. I mean, you know, they last just a few minutes. And it's mostly just about setting the hearing date. So, I mean, just to start with that, there is so much you can do with that first preliminary conference to really go through people's options and different ways you can structure it and different tools that you might use in the process. Um, you know, is bifurcation something that would be useful or wouldn't be useful? You know, talk through the dispositive motions. Do they make sense? Do they not make sense? And kind of walk through that. Uh, you know, would a Kaplan opening, having some kind of review in the middle make sense? I don't know. I've done a lot of work on mock arbitrations and final offer arbitration also. You know, maybe you throw that out. You know, if that's something parties want to consider as something that would help them uh, move the ball forward in terms of their thinking about the case. So I just think, you know, to start a really active and proactive first conference with the parties can make a world of difference to the case. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how it's not only being proactive, but I think it's being problem solving oriented. Um, and trying to help the parties maybe 
there are things they hadn't really thought about, like you said, final offer arbitration or or other or bifurcation or thinking through. Do you ever see like a when you mentioned the psychology of it, what sort of psychological shifts have you seen um, that happen during that preliminary discussion? Yeah, you know, I will say that, you know, I don't know if it happens right then, but, you know, some of those we've talked about in terms of even decision making by arbitrators. So just to pick some biases that we're all familiar with, you know, confirmation bias, for example, mm -hmm. is a good one, right? So parties certainly suffer from that, even, even, even worse than the arbitrators do, I'm sure, right? You really believe in your own side. So I think that when people want to make a dispositive motion at the beginning, you know, we're always concerned about not letting them make ones that we know we're going to lose because they're very time consuming and expensive. On the other hand, if you use your intuition and you get the sense that they really need the answer to that dispositive motion in order to settle the case, then yeah, you might do it. And that'll help with their help counter their confirmation bias because they will, they will know. They will get some, they'll either win or lose, or they'll get some perspective on, on the arbitrator's thinking on that particular issue. So we can really diffuse the confirmation bias, you know, for example. Um, so, you know, I'm really thinking about tools that we already use and how, and how they can really impact people's thinking as we go through it. Um, you know, or like the Kaplan opening, if we do that in the middle of the case and have the parties there, and this whole, you know, feeling like you've been heard so mm -hmm. if you have to go all the way to the end in the full hearing, maybe like a little kind of mini hearing in the middle would serve that purpose and, and get that sense of justice and connection to the decision maker. Uh, so I think, you know, I think we just have to open our minds a little bit to thinking about the tools that we use and, and whether we should be using more of them more often or at least raising them with the parties as maybe for this case, these make sense. Right. Well, and another thing you mentioned, you know, the preliminary hearing being so important and not pro forma, um, you know, what's wrong with letting the parties talk to each other a little bit during that hearing, right? Why does it have to just be strictly, okay, you know, following the checklist? Um, you know, it, it actually sometimes can lead to settlement just because that's maybe the first time and only time that they actually talk to each other at all. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. You know, and sometimes you figure things out, you know, I'm you can really obviate motions often. You know, I had one case, you know, for example, where they had named, I don't know, 15 respondents. And I said, you know, why do we have 15 respondents here? Because the first respondent was perfectly capable of paying if they were to prevail. And they said, well, we're afraid they're gonna sue us. And I said, well, wait a minute, we're not gonna go through this whole motion practice on non-signatories because you're afraid they're gonna, you know, how about a stipulation? You know, yeah. kind of resolve the problem. So there was a nice little step between the parties and those 14 people disappeared from the case. Uh, so, you know, when you talk to them, you can you can sometimes find resolutions without, you know, stepping out of role and just kind of, I just had one recently. Uh, anyway, I won't go into it, but you know, it, those kinds of things come up with some regularity and you kind of work through the problem with them if you find out what they care about, kind of like the mediators do, find out what the interest is here and see if you can resolve it in some way that is, more efficient and less costly. Oh yeah. And better gets, solution, right? And it's always a better solution for the parties actually too. Well, yeah. I mean, the question though, I mean, you kind of mentioned a minute ago, but I do think every once in a while, like an arbitrator has to kind of stop and say, okay, but if I allow for this, do I appear as though I'm no longer neutral, right? Is this somehow actually more beneficial for one party over the other? And I'm the one providing yeah. the idea and they hadn't thought about it, right? And so now there's that question. So how do you sort of deal with those kind of struggles and kind of making sure that you don't step out of line in terms of remaining neutral? Well, you know, I gave a talk on, on whether you should raise new things with the parties. I came up with a laundry list of 12 questions you should ask yourself. And, you know, one of them is exactly that. Am I not gonna seem impartial? Is it gonna cost more? Uh, do I really need to do it? I mean, if you're getting to sort of more final questions, whether you want to raise new issues, um, you know, talk to your other arbitrators if there are anybody, you know, anybody else. So, you know, you do have to be careful. You know, I yeah. think th those kinds of suggestions, you know, really only make sense. The stipulation kind of suggestion, which does work from time to time, you know, really only makes sense if it's clearly going to satisfy the interest of both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, otherwise you kind of, you know, you talk, you get a little bit of intuition going and see what makes most sense for that case and, and what you should, should or should not encourage or permit. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are some of the similar issues mediators face all the time, right? Because there's always going to be this question is, you know, you got to kind of, but then as you mentioned, I mean, now we're seeing this move toward more 
I don't know, evaluative mediation, which almost looks semi quasi arbitration, right? So I think we are seeing, as you mentioned with the convention, um, you know, that lines get blurred a little bit. No, it does. You know, I think at least in the Northeast, you know, I don't see evaluative mediation as being new at all. Um, you know, I think it is something that, you know, many of us try to do as late in the day, you know, try to get the parties there without being evaluated if you can, and often you can. But if you can't, I think most people, you know, do, depending on where they are, because some jurisdictions don't allow it. And if you're really facilitative, you don't do it. But I think most of us that do commercial do get evaluative in order to get to the end in many of the mediations that we do. And parties expect it and want it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I don't find that to be a new process. It's kind of been around for a long time. Yeah, that's, and an, an, an I think you're right. I mean, even back in the day when I was um, in practice, um, often we were frustrated if the mediator wasn't willing to give us their opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's really what people want and they've done mm -hmm. on that. That's what people are looking for. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have to be a little bit guarded because you don't know everything about the case. So you have to be a little careful. Uh, you know, that's come up in the context of arbitration as well because the German practice is to give preliminary views. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pretty routinely because the judges do that, the judges get them together. And so, you know, the Germanic, the Swiss, the Austrians do it as well, and the Chinese to some extent. So the question is, should that become one of the tools that we use more commonly and make available to the parties? And when? Is it just before the hearing? Is it after the hearing? Although by then, they have pretty much spent a lot of money and time. Right. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it's sort of interesting. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. interesting. Right, giving preliminary views. I don't know, but I used when I used to do my psych talks, and it is, as I said, quite common in the Germanic practice. And so I was talking about confirmation bias and the fact that if you've given your preliminary views, the chances of your actually being able to move off those preliminary views may be challenging. Mm -hmm. And maybe on an unconscious, unconscious level, you're only going to hear what supports the preliminary view. And on two occasions, two different German arbitrators raised their hands and said, Oh, that's not true. I changed my mind once in one of my cases. And I thought that kind of proved my point. I thought. Yeah. <laughs> once in one case. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and that actually gets to even um, this idea of using AI or augmented intelligence to pre you know, provide case predictions at the outset. You know, yeah. is that going to improve yeah. efficiency or is it going to create these kind of confirmation or anchoring bias most yeah. definitely absolutely so that's going to be an interesting development are we going to become superfluous or or not i don't know time will tell yeah i don't think so though because as you were mentioning i mean a lot of what happens you know in that preliminary hearing or as you think about your role as an arbitrator as a problem solver you're using an awful lot of intuition and no machine certainly it's not sufficiently developed at this point in terms of machine learning um, to have that sort of intuition, because of course it will have to be based on the data consumed by the AI, right? And so that's gonna be based on past data. And so it might not allow for new ideas, um, which is really important as we kind of use our intuition. Yeah, and I think it's gonna be much harder to do AI in arbitration than in court, because there's not gonna be as much public that they can access to sort of make a prediction with respect to the individual. Absolutely. Right. And yep. each case is, is unique, right? It's got its own facts, its own law, its new witnesses. So to make a prediction without really knowing more mm -hmm. about the arbitrator would be tough. And definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, are there any final um, pieces of advice for arbitrators as they think about their role in being a proactive arbitrator, not being afraid to be proactive? Yeah. You know, I will say there's been a lot that's been written about. Um, due process paranoia. And I guess I would advise you not to be a due process paranoid because you know the, the, the chances of being vacated because you were proactive are essentially microscopic. As long as you give both parties an opportunity to be heard and to speak to whatever you're raising. Uh, so I think you wanna make sure that as you raise, you, know, you don't wanna seem not impartial. You wanna seem totally independent and really treating everybody equally, but that doesn't mean you can't really take a lot of measures and suggestions to, do you want to consider this? Do you want to consider that? Would this make sense for this case uh, or not? And, and in that sense, kind of create a more tailored process for each case. Absolutely. Those are great words to end on. So thank you so much for taking time. This was a really helpful conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Thanks a lot.